This was an event in December 2019 celebrating the closure of one of Ghana's largest witches camps. I humbly officially declared Nabule alleged witches camp duly closed. Setting over 50 women accused of witchcraft free to go back home. <laughs> It was a happy day. Everyone in this village was in attendance, including the chiefs and even soothsayers who for years have been believed to have the power to pass a judgment on whether a woman is a witch or not. The women who have been living in these camps have been condemned to a life of bondage, torture, and sometimes murder. But the unheard dark secrets of Ghana's witches' camps are the stories of the hundreds of children and minors who live here. Some were actually born in these camps of bondage. Others brought in to live with women suspected to be witches. Witchcraft uh, accusation is deep-seated. These children who accompanied these women are also tagged as witches' grandchildren. Ghana is heralded the world over as a shining example of a human rights oasis in a region noted for widespread human rights abuse cases. So why does this country still maintain camps for witches? As over 400,000 children of school-going age remain out of the classroom, these camps are worsening the problem. If children are not in school in the camp, then it even makes it more serious. And what is needed to take these children out of these camps of abuse, which are ironically seen as safe havens away from persecution and brutality? <laughs> This film lifts the veil of the dark, lonely world of the children living in Ghana's witches' camps. It's a Hamatan morning in Nabuli. The weather is brutally harsh, dry, windy, and cold all at the same time. The town's children have come to gather around fire as dawn breaks. This is how to keep warm here. <laughs> Mary, like many of the children here, are in the town not because they chose to. Their grandparents were accused of witchcraft. Some of the accused women are old, weak and frail. Unable to do any chores on their own, they cannot survive in this camp without help. And these children were the ones forced to leave their homes so their weak grandparents could live in a witch's camp. Okay, 
Naka bag book a yayo swanly. Bamka book a bit and I muffing book a bag and yayo swanny, muffing do. No abo muffing in yam up. Enjoy the unconkey, oko, uncadium conkey, winja. For twenty five years, Naboli, located in the Gushegu district, has had only one claim to fame the Naboli Witches Camp. A so-called deity here that could cleanse people of witchcraft became a safe haven for women who came from far and near to seek help after their communities banished them. One of them is Bakpo Tig, who lives here with her grandson, Blasiem Jekpora. Tig's story of how she came here is similar to that of many of the women here. She refused to attend the funeral of a family member who had died. That singular act was enough to earn her a witchcraft tag. She was beaten, nearly killed and fearing for her life. She fled her village and came here. <laughs> I'm <laughs> My name is Suleimana Abukar. They born me in 1963 in Nabuli town here. Suleimana has lived in Nabuli all his life. He is the one who led me here and has been helping me around with translations. A strong community leader and a symbol of comfort for many of these women. The witch camp is, is started in 19... 95. Okay, they brought them to help their grandmothers and fetch water and find firewood for them. Some of them have been cooking for the grandmothers. Some of them are old. They can't go and fetch water. They can't cook themselves. That's why the grandchildren come and stay with them. If Konkomba child reach about six or seven years, she herself cook a tea for his mother. And the mother and the father go to farm. That child will cook tea and go to the farm to give the parents. So Konkomba no get small child. If it is small like this, he will go farm. If it is a girl, he will, he will carry a water since his beginning up to, if he reach six years or seven, he can cook soup and cook tea and the father and the mother to eat. After we come, we don't get any business, only farmers. We are farming. That's why the, we too are suffering with the children. You said there are 27 children here. Out of the 27, how many do you think are in school and how many are out of school? Okay. The way they in school, they reach 13. The one who go into school, they are 13 in number. Yes. And so you have 13, you have 13 out of 27, leaving 14. Going to school. Ghana has many laws on child rights. The clearest of all is the Children's Act 560, enacted 22 years ago. It says in part that no person shall deny a child the right to live with his parents and family and grow up in a caring and peaceful environment unless it is proved in court that living with his parents would a lead to significant harm to the child or b subject the child to serious abuse or c not be in the interest of the child that same law guarantees a right to education for all children.
Back in Accra, I meet Joseph Wetal, who heads the Commission of Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Shraj. He knows the subject too well. Many years ago, Wetal worked for the Shraj in the Upper East region as a young officer. He spent some months to study the lives of women in the Gambaga Witches Camp, also one of the country's largest. His report then formed the basis of many of the government-led interventions into assisting women in witches' camps in Ghana. There was no camp. There was no encampment like walls and all that. And so we gave our recommendations that no, there were issues with regard to the terminology that was being employed, that you, when you talk about a camp, then you assume that there is some restriction of movement, that the women can come and go at their will. The only thing is that they, they themselves don't want to go based on our findings because of what could happen to them back in the communities. So, the long and short of it is, we recommended that it is the responsibility of the state, first and foremost, to come to the rescue of such women. Um, if it was a simple case, you would not sit here to interview me. It would take a bit of time. When cases are reported of either beatings or violations against women and driving them out, and we go to investigate. Naturally, this, this border on crime, right? But because we are the ones who have to look at the human rights angle, we invite the people, they come. First thing they say is, no, we are not the people, it's the woman and her own family who drove her out. In the meantime, the women need some sucker. If they can't go back to their communities for now, can we ensure that they are enrolled on LIP? Can we ensure that they are given some microfinance so that they can operate from another place and their children can join them there where they will not be known? It's hard to find where to put the blame for the conditions of children in witches' camps. In some ways, the camps are safe havens, offering accused witches and their children a place to run from persecution and sometimes even killings. In part, this is a result of a broken social protection system that has no room for state-run centers to replace witches' camps, places that could be monitored and effectively regulated. Much of the work and resources that have gone into supporting alleged witches and their children have come from right campaigners with very little government money. Such resources may run out at some point as these organizations refocused where to invest. It leaves you wondering how and when this very complex problem would be solved, if it ever will.